Hello everyone, this is Zuki and today I'm bringing you a new cooking video. Apologies for the lack of content for the past 8 days, but I had to deal with my girlfriend's parents coming over for dinner at some point. So there was a massive amount of preparation involved in making cakes and brining chicken and roasting and peeling and all sorts of shit. It was a huge feast. Mostly because I wanted it to be, not because it had to be. But regardless, it was really good food and everything went fine. So here I am again bringing you more good stuff. I have this one and a couple of more videos to do until I go home. But I figured out a way to actually produce cooking content at home as well. Since I don't have to do live commentary, it's not always necessary. So I can just film myself cooking in my awkward kitchen and then just do commentary and post. So that'll work out pretty well. Anyway, this particular video is of a dessert this time. I'm going to be baking something inspired by traditional Czech sweet filled buns called buhti. This one is very similar to that, but the fillings are different and the dough is different. But the dough I'm going to do today is an all-purpose sweet dough, which I sort of engineered, which anyone can do. It's super easy and uh, you can use it for anything from cinnamon rolls to... Basically anything that involves rolling, filling, stuffing, twisting, any sort of sweet pastry except something that uses puff pastry, obviously. But any sort of yeasted dough pastry can, can use my, my dough and it's really good. Very rich, very tasty, and it keeps for about three days, which is, I guess it's, it's pretty decent for, uh, for a home-baked good which doesn't use dough enhancers. A dough enhancer, by the way, is something that a lot of commercial bakeries put in their products to increase the shelf life of their their pastries and breads. Uh, it's not really damaging to you, but it's just something like ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, increases the fluffiness and all that shit. There's also diastatic malt powder, which also does kind of the same thing. Amylase, which is contained in, in malt powder and they all have like different effects on on the rise on the fluffiness on how long it stays fluffy and and moist and all that shit so i'm not using any dough enhancers right now this is all natural so it doesn't last as long as other stuff that you find in in commercial bakeries and it never it never will if you do it at home so yeah anyway I'm going to start off with the fillings for these sweet buns. These are basically like small filled buns. You put in a 9 by 13 inch baking pan and you let them rise and then you bake them. And they each have like a couple of tablespoons of filling inside, which is very delicious and quite easy to do. So the first one I'm going to do is a cream cheese filling. Now, traditionally, Czechs have a, a form of cream cheese that kind of looks like ricotta. It's called tvaro or something. That's, that's irrelevant. But you can use cream cheese or even ricotta cheese or any sort of soft, fresh cheese that you might have in your country. So I have about 200 grams or 7 ounces of that mixed with about a quarter cup of sugar, just regular white sugar. Uh, a package of vanilla sugar, or you can just use a teaspoon of vanilla essence, but I always prefer vanilla sugar over essence because I think the, the flavor of the vanilla in the vanilla sugar is a bit more pure and not so chemical as it is in the in the essence or extract. Actually, extract, there's a pretty major difference between vanilla essence and vanilla extract. There's pure vanilla extract, which is the good shit. It's the really expensive shit, but it's the really good stuff. And there's the chemically engineered vanilla essence, which is a sort of an imitation, a poor imitation of what vanilla is supposed to taste like. So, yeah, vanilla sugar just tastes a bit more natural, I think. To that, I add one egg yolk. So separate the egg, but don't throw away the white, because we're going to be using that for something else a bit later. And also a handful of raisins. Obviously, you can omit the raisins if you don't like them, but we're pretty big on raisins in Europe, so I see no reason why I shouldn't add raisins in almost everything. I really like them, though. But I know that in America, there's quite a few people that have a, an aversion to raisins for some unknown reason. So you can put something else in there, like cranberries or some form of chopped nuts if you want, or any sort of sweet dried fruit, even candied uh, orange peel or something like that, or grated lemon lemon zest or orange zest. There's like any sort of fruit that works with, with sweetness, I suppose. So mix all that and then cover it in foil and pop it in the fridge. I'm also going to be doing a second kind of filling, which is a ground walnut filling. 
This is the same type of, type of filling we use for our traditional Christmas breads in Romania. So I just thought that like, why not fill buns with it? It would be kind of the same thing. Plus, it just so happened that I bought like an insane amount of walnuts and I needed something to use them for. So I'm going to start off by separating three eggs. But by God, do not throw away the yolks because we're going to use that for the dough. Like the dough actually uses three yolks. So separate the eggs, put the whites along with the first white that you, you separated the first time. So that makes a total of four egg whites. We're going to be using those for the actual walnut filling. So beat the egg whites with a whisk or just pop them in the mixer or grab a hand mixer and make like, I guess, soft peaks would be ideal for this. But you can, you can have it like semi-liquidy as well. It doesn't really matter. Soft peaks obviously is a, a degree by which beating egg whites or whipped cream is measured so if you grab a whisk and you pop it in there and then you you turn it upside down if the peak falls over then that's a soft peak if it stays upwards then that's a hard peak and that's as much as you should beat any sort of egg white or uh, whipped cream so beat the egg whites and then grab about 200 grams or seven ounces of ground walnuts I ground these myself in a food processor and a kind of a janky food processor I have here in this apartment, but I'm pretty sure you can find ground walnuts in supermarkets or if not, just grab like regular walnuts, toast them in a 350 Fahrenheit or 175 oven for five minutes, leave them out to cool and then just grind them in a food processor or just mash them up with a knife or a pan or anything just so they are not like big and chunky. So to that, add one quarter cup of sugar, a teaspoon of rum. I like rum in my walnuts. Um, it just works well. It's a Romanian thing. A handful of raisins, again, because raisins and walnuts seem to go pretty well together. And to that, add start adding the beaten egg whites, kind of a couple of tablespoons or a quarter cup at a time, until you get like a paste that holds together very well but isn't too tough. So, but not too soft either. It's not supposed to flow. It's supposed to be kind of like, I guess the consistency of cream cheese in the end, since we're using that as well. So once that's done, put on plastic foil and you don't need to put this one in the fridge. Just keep it out at room temperature until the dough is ready. Now, as for the dough, and this is the main part of the video that I want to talk about, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to doughs. Now, I've had some pretty miserable experiences with doughs in the past, following letters to the following letters, following recipes to the letter, uh, simply because the flour is very different from country to country and from type to type. Usually in America, the classification for flours is cake flour, which has very a very low amount of protein, which is used for muffins and cakes, something that's not supposed to be chewy something that's soft and crumbly. Then there's all-purpose flour, which has about 10 to 11% protein. That's generally used for cookies, uh, breads as well. General, any sort of baking kind of works with that. It's a very balanced type of flour. And then there's bread flour, which has a high amount of protein, about 12 to 14%. And that's generally used for breads that need to be chewy, something like French baguettes or rustic breads. You don't want those crumbly. You want them chewy and elastic like bread's supposed to be but here in the czech republic for example it's a completely different classification they have rough flour which is actually coarsely ground which they use for their own shit they have semi-coarse which is as the name says semi-coarse and then they have uh, like i guess fine flour but the fine flour differs greatly from brand to brand as well i found fine flour with 14 percent protein which is crazy i've never seen that in romania and not really as often in America either. And I found fine flour with 10% protein, which I guess is the regular all-purpose one. So it really doesn't, they don't even pay attention to how much protein the flour has here, but it really does matter for baking products. So for this type of dough, I would recommend using all-purpose flour. I don't even know what kind of flour I'm using anymore because I mixed a few different types. I just found like five different kinds of flour with five different amounts of protein in them and just mix them all up in my flour jar. So yeah, that's uh, it's a bit uh, insane with the flour. But the main premise of the dough is that you only add as much flour as it needs. I found that to be the best way to handle baking yeasted products because, again, 
some really bad experiences in the past following recipes saying add 22 ounces of flour and then you add you measure out the 22 ounces or however many hundreds of grams that is and you end up with something that looks like a brick you could actually lay it on your house foundation that it, it would hold it's that tough and dry so it's really not very accurate and not very conducive to your end goal to follow recipes when it comes to flour only when it comes to other ingredients I guess it's better that you you stick to what they say but when it comes to flour just go by feeling and for, generally for yeasted rich doughs like this one the the feeling is that it's supposed to be tacky at the end after the kneading process tacky means it doesn't stick to the counter it doesn't stick to your hands but when you do touch it there's a light bit of sticking that's how the final product should be and that's generally the perfect yeasted dough in this case so we're going to start off with 100 grams of sugar. I definitely recommend using a scale. If you don't have one, just get one. Because seriously, volume measurements for this sort of shit are, are stupid. They're just plain stupid. Unless you're talking liquids or um, yeast. Yeast works fine with volume measurements or salt or sugar. But generally for butter and um, flour or any sort of solid ingredients, it's better to stick with the scale. So 100 grams of sugar, I'm going to replace some of that sugar with about three packets of vanilla sugar instead of the one teaspoon of vanilla essence, because fuck that. 120 grams of butter. Now you can use butter in a combination of, or a combination of butter and shortening. Chex happen to have a shortening that tastes like butter. It's basically vegetable shortening, which they use for baking. So it's okay to use that as well instead of uh, a quantity of the butter. It's a lot of butter, I know, but this is a rich dough. And as opposed to lean doughs, which are made only from flour, water, salt, and yeast, which are like French baguettes or rustic breads, rich doughs are better suited for pastry and um, sweet products, obviously, because they have, they're more tender, they're, they're softer, and they keep a bit longer. And now, this dough will keep, once it's baked, obviously, it will keep for around three days until it becomes a bit difficult and a bit dry, I suppose. But that's pretty much normal because in, in commercial bakeries, you won't really find, um, well, in commercial bakeries, basically, the, the idea is that they use a lot of dough enhancers. These dough enhancers have the role of increasing the shelf life of products, increasing the tenderness. Uh, it's all kind of forced chemical reactions, really. Like they use amylase, which is a, a compound found in uh, diastatic malt powder. Or a combination of both of those, which increases softness, tenderness, and uh, shelf life. They also use uh, ascorbic acid, which is basically vitamin C, which also helps the tenderness and the rise. They use a bunch of shit that's not necessarily damaging, not saying that, but they do have some pretty powerful effects on how long um, baked products will last and how soft they'll be. So, I mean, I'm, I'm down for using all that stuff, but I just don't happen to have it here. So mine is going to be all natural, and it's not going to last as long as it would with the dough enhancers. So yeah, 100 grams of butter and 20 grams of shortening, or 120 grams of butter. The next step is warming up half a cup of milk with a pinch of sugar, just until it's warm to the touch. In this uh, mixture, we're going to add 3 teaspoons of yeast, dry yeast, obviously, and whisk that in and let it sit for about 5 minutes. In the meantime, just cream the butter and sugar, and by creaming means grab a whisk and whisk vigorously, like your life depends on it, until they're both homogenized and look looks like a cream, basically. That's kind of the idea. And start adding the yolks that you separated a while ago, one at a time, until they're all incorporated in there. <clears throat> to this mixture, we're going to add half a cup of buttermilk, buttermilk being like a sour milk product. But the role of this is it increases tenderness and, and it gives it a bit of flavor. It's acidic and it has a bit of a tang, so it works with most sweet baked products. It's really good, actually. Half a cup of buttermilk and then pour in the, the yeast and milk mixture. The yeast should have fluffed up by now and it, it should look pretty foamy. Just make sure you scrape all the yeast off the walls of the pot if there is some left. And the next step is adding... Uh, the, the zest of an orange and the zest of a lemon. These do a lot in, in boosting the flavor of, of sweet products, and it generally works to add these to pretty much anything except chocolate. Something that contains chocolate might actually work with orange, but not necessarily with lemon zest. So just keep that in mind. 
And then you start adding the flour. I'm adding it a quarter cup at a time and whisking to incorporate it every after each addition. Now this whole thing looks like a curl, curdled mess right now, and that's totally fine. Once you start adding the flour, it's going to get uh, bound more and more, and it's going to start looking like an actual dough. So just keep adding flour. Don't measure that shit. According to the recipe, this whole thing is supposed to take about 500 grams of flour. But to be honest, when I made it before, it took about 470. And when I made it another time, it took about 520. So again, it really depends on what kind of flour you're using. But I use the same amount of liquid ingredients. So, you know, it just differs greatly. Like 50 grams of flour can make a whole lot of difference in a dough like this. So just be careful with the flour. So start adding it a quarter cup at a time, whisking it vigorously every time. And then once it gets too difficult to whisk, grab a spatula and start incorporating the flour until the dough uh, detaches from the, the walls of the bowl. Once that happens, it's time to start kneading. So just flour the board or your counter, turn the dough onto the board, scrape off the walls of the bowl to get any sort of bits. The dough is supposed to be really sticky at this point, but it should hold in a solid mass. So sprinkle some flour on top and start kneading. Now there is a an actual method to kneading, but I prefer to not use that method and just fuck around because it works every time for me, so why not? Basically the, the main idea is to push down with the heel of your palm on the downstroke and to pull on the upstroke with your fingers to fold the dough onto itself and just keep repeating that over and over and over again. You can turn the dough with one of your hands or you can use both hands for this or you can alternate hands. I do that as well. Just do that motion in one direction with your left and then repeat the motion in the other direction with your right. And just keep kneading and kneading and kneading. The dough is most likely going to stick to the counter for a while. So just use a dough scraper or the, the back edge of a, a knife to scrape up the bits. And just sprinkle a, a tiny bit of flour every time on the dough or just flour your hands. That's actually a, a better tip. Flour your hands if the dough still feels sticky and keep kneading until it stops being sticky and it's just tacky. And that's going to take about, I guess, 10 to 15 minutes. This is basically the, all the amount of labor that you're going to have to do for this, this whole thing. And once it's uh, very smooth and well put together and there are no lumps in it and it's elastic and nice and pretty, you put it in a lightly oiled bowl, cover that with plastic wrap or just put the entire bowl in a garbage bag like I usually do as well. And just let it rise in a warm place for about an hour. It should pretty much double in volume, but it's that's hard to gauge. So just when it looks really inflated, that's when it's ready. All doughs generally need about one to one and a half hours to rise, depending on how much yeast you added to them. But in, this one actually contains a bit more yeast than uh, than necessary usually. So it's going to move pretty quickly. So once the dough has risen, this is like the first rise. You punch it down to remove all the air from it, and you divide it into 20 equal portions. Uh, you can eyeball it, just roll it into a log and divide it by eye, or I prefer to just use the kitchen scale and divide it into 20 equal portions. Each of these is going to be an individual bun. So butter a 9 by 13 inch baking pan. It needs to have walls that the buns can rise up and not spread all over your oven. And... Uh, roll well the, this is like one of the hardest parts to to grasp i guess <clears throat> take each each bit of dough and fold it into itself so it forms a smooth ball and then you put it on the counter with the the seam side down and you cup your hand over it but you don't actually hold the ball you just cup your hand over it lightly fingers should be touching the counter and then you start rolling either clock, clockwise or counterclockwise and what that's going to do it's going to like move the, the dough ball around in that space between your hand and the counter and it's going to stretch the skin and make it really smooth and shiny and perfectly round that's like a technique that i i learned in time it's a bit difficult for beginners i guess considering my girlfriend has problems with doing that but i find it perfectly natural because i've been doing it like this for a long time so just cup your hand over it and start moving in a in a circular motion and it should happen naturally in the end, it's pretty easy. So make all the 20 pieces like that and then cover them with plastic wrap lightly so it doesn't they don't dry out and form a skin. And then you need to start filling the buns. You could just bake the buns without any filling. I mean, they're, they're pretty sweet as they are and they could work. But it's generally better, 
well, since we have the filling, obviously, I'm going to fucking use it and not sit around and not use it. So uh, <clears throat> get your fillings out of the fridge, grab each piece of dough, and make a thin circle out of it, about 10 centimeters in diameter. I prefer using the palm of my hand because I have big hands and they're pretty soft, so you can just use the heel of your palm to stretch the dough out on the counter. You, you shouldn't be adding any extra flour at this point. Like The dough should have enough flour in it that it doesn't stick to the counter. You can actually oil the counter very lightly. That'll generally do enough to, to keep it from sticking. So just spread out each piece of dough, put about a tablespoon and a half of filling inside or however much you think is necessary, and then fold the edges up, twist them so they, they close, and then put it with the that part down on the counter and repeat that whole uh, cupping the hand around it and rolling around motion that I talked about. And you should have a sealed bun with a smooth skin, perfectly round, with the filling neatly sealed inside. And just start placing that in the buttered 9 by 13 inch pan. I did four rows of five buns each, so that's 20 in total. Half and half. Half have the uh, walnut filling and half... Half have... God, that's difficult to say. Half have the, um, the cream cheese and raisin filling. <clears throat> Now they need to go through a second rise, what is called proofing. In the meantime, heat your oven to about 350 or 175 Celsius and put the dough, put the buns in the pan, cover them lightly with plastic wrap. You don't need to stretch that over it because it's likely that they'll rise over the edge and then you don't want them sticking to the plastic wrap. And uh, as you put each bun in the pan, Brush it with melted butter so they don't stick together too much. They're supposed to stick together in the end, but they should come apart really easily. So leave them in the in a warm place in the pan for about half an hour to 45 minutes. They should fluff up and take up all the space in the pan, and they should look nice and round and puffy. And remove the plastic wrap, pop them in the oven for about... It took me like 25 to 27 minutes, but my oven is a bit shitty because it's a it's not my oven. It's the guy who owns this apartment. And I think the element inside is actually broken partially, so it doesn't heat up uniformly. So it took me 27 minutes, but it might take you a little longer. If you have a thermometer, the internal temperature should be about 175 Fahrenheit or 180. Um, that's generally a standard for rich doughs. And if you don't have a thermometer, just bake them for 25 minutes and then feel them if it's liquidy inside or not, or if it's set up. But it should be pretty safe, considering that filling um, is it's basically safe to eat at 165 Celsius. So 25 minutes should bring it up to that temperature. Take them out of the oven. They should look nice brown, golden on the top. And immediately powder them with some powdered sugar. Or you can brush them with uh, a syrup of water and sugar or melted butter again why not that works too generally everything works here or just regular sugar or hell even cinnamon if you want just go nuts you can powder them with anything you want but i prefer powdered sugar because that's pretty much standard and leave them to cool for about half an hour before you start munching them the filling is going to be piping hot so that's going to be kind of problematic to eat straight away but i'm just removing one so you can see what it looks like very soft, it's cloudy, it's puffy, it's golden, it looks yellow and rich and eggy and buttery. These are fucking awesome, seriously. And this dough works perfectly well for anything, especially cinnamon rolls. If you make this with cinnamon rolls, it's going to be like the best shit ever. The softest, fluffiest cinnamon rolls you've ever had. So keep this recipe. It's a really good one. It's one that's I, I did like a comparison of five different enriched dough recipes, each one with different proportions of egg to butter to milk to buttermilk. Some used four entire eggs, some used one egg, some used two eggs. But I think that using three yolks is generally kind of the best way, and I've read in a baking book somewhere that three yolks per one pound of flour is kind of what you want to go for. It's kind of the ideal ratio of yolk. What the eggs do is each of these elements has a, <clears throat> a role in making the dough softer and making the final product richer and fluffier. No, the butter, the milk, the buttermilk, and the eggs all do something in, in enhancing this particular dough. So this is going to be a recipe, a spin-off recipe of the traditional Czech bukti. <clears throat> 
But again, it doesn't have to be. You can make it whatever you want. Use your imagination. So I hope you enjoyed it and you found it useful. And if you didn't, link it to your mother. Because I'm pretty sure that if she does any baking, she's going to want to see this. I know a lot of mothers, not necessarily mothers, but women that have really big issues understanding how those work and what they're supposed to do with them and how to make them rich and fluffy and delicious. So hopefully this should provide some sort of inspiration, if not explanation, as to how to proceed with uh, that style of baking. Anyway, thanks for watching. Please rate that shit and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.